Welcome to Stacktastic, the weekly web show for the avid comic book reader and those who aspire to become so. And today it's time once again for Opinionation, where I give you my thoughts on the latest comics I've been reading. Beware, slight spoilers. Plus, I hope you'll share your own opinions in the comments down below. And as always, my weekly recommendations of what comics to pick up or download this week. While I don't think the industry is quite there yet, last week in my own mind I upgraded Kieran Gillen to superstar writer status. Why? Because AVX Consequences has been that good. Sure, Cyclops and Wolverine are still having the same arguments and schism, but Gillen did a great job moving that argument forward. Now, whether or not it's a good idea to make Cyclops and Wolverine the new Magneto and Xavier remains to be seen, and I think it would have been more poetic to carve H's on everyone's eyes like those M's, but I guess that's just my villainous style. But long story short, literally, is that you could just buy AVX Consequences rather than the whole AVX and be totally caught up and happy. As for Gillen, as a reader, I've been noticing him for a while now, thanks to his stellar work with Kid Loki over on Journey into Mystery. Gillen's recent crossover with Matt Fraction, Everything Burns, is one of the best Thor stories I've ever read, an epic conclusion to Gillen's run on Mystery before handing it over to Catherine Immonen and Sif. But that's not out in trade yet, as it just wrapped up, so if you don't feel like long box diving, pick up the new trade Exiled, which was a summer crossover between Journey into Mystery and New Mutants. I think the Desir give the Amazons a run for their money. And with Marvel now, Gillen has just taken over Iron Man, giving the title as close a vibe to the movies as possible. I didn't read Iron Man before, so I can't tell you what's changed. I believe this new version has more pepper. However, I might be reading Iron Man now, and isn't that the whole point? Let's hope Marvel realizes they've got a quality writer in Gillen because it's a shame that Jeff Parker never got the recognition he deserved. Last week I recommended you pick up a Before Watchmen Moloch number one, and I still do, underscoring that it's for mature readers. However, don't expect anything new. That means so-so storytelling from J. Michael Straczynski and fantastic artwork from Eduardo Rizzo. Yes, I knew what I was getting into and I wasn't surprised. Moloch's origin story is nothing we haven't heard before, but thanks to an interesting final page, it looks like this miniseries might get a little more interesting next issue. I would like to echo a statement about Before Watchmen, though, that I've heard elsewhere, and that it's nice to see these books striving to be their best, even if they do fall a little short sometimes. It's like Before Watchmen is DC's very own mainstream Vertigo line. If only we could get a Before Watchmen Superman or Before Watchmen Green Lantern, two groups of titles that seem to be content just making it to press each month. Many might argue that Before Watchmen isn't the prequel that Alan Moore deserves, but it sports the quality this industry needs. You know, I just didn't think Deadpool number one was funny. To be fair, I haven't really enjoyed Deadpool since Joe Kelly's character-defining run, but I had high hopes considering the talent behind this Marvel Now relaunch. You've got two comedians writing it and Tony Moore on pencils, with only the latter really delivering. Historical humor is tough to pull off, and I got the feeling Posen and Dugan only have a basic knowledge of presidential history. I can understand they might have wanted to make the jokes accessible to the average non-history buff reader, but that maybe they shouldn't have chosen that subject in the first place. After all, I think the only presidents that Deadpool is interested in are the green ones. Because Moore's artwork is so good and I have fond memories of Kelly's run, I'll give this another shot or two, but I no longer have high hopes. But maybe I will pick up the new Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe trade, which I hear is a damn good read. Speaking of guys who look good in red, I love that Marvel is trying to raise Daredevil's profile. As I've said many times, if you're not reading Mark Waid's Daredevil, you are missing out. But now, in addition to joining the Avengers, where alas he gets little horn time, this past week was the beginning of a neat little team up with Domino over in X-Men. It's not the greatest thing I ever read, but it's a fun read and reminds me of a low-profile episode of a good animated series. Poison Ivy and Clayface appear to be getting married. This is a brilliant idea. He's soil, get it? Too bad it's only introduced on the last page of Detective Comics number 14, making the rest of the issue a wash. But Detective Comics 15, I'll be there. I really love Miles Morales, but sometimes I wish he wasn't stuck in the Ultimate Universe. That's because his title started out so strong, but has recently been mired down by crappy crossovers, forced to incorporate story elements from the other Ultimate titles that I couldn't care about less. Captain America is president? Please! Lex Luthor did it first, and it sucked then too. As a result, the fascinating struggle Miles has been facing over whether he's following in the footsteps of his father or his uncle has pretty much disappeared. And whatever happened to Gonk and Judge? All these wonderful and fresh supporting characters have been replaced by the same old, same old, the Avengers and Peter Parker's family. And when are we going to get Miles in the 616? 
As for this week, it finally is Marvel Now, as four major titles debut. First, there's all new X-Men, where we'll get at least an idea of Bendis' time travel experiment bringing the original X-Men into the present is a stroke of genius or a poorly thought out gimmick. Then there's Fantastic Four, where Matt Fraction will try to fill the unstable molecules of fan favorite Jonathan Hickman. The new Thor also debuts, and it looks like the first thing Jason Aaron and Esad Ribic are doing is introducing steroids to Asgard. There's also the new X-Men Legacy, and quite frankly, anything would be better than the old X-Men Legacy. Legion takes over the spotlight from Rogue, and for the first time ever, I notice a similarity between Legion and Dokken. Maybe they should start some kind of hair-raising support group. Then over at DC, you might want to pick up Phantom Stranger number 2. The debut issue was a solid read, and showed that we'll be learning more about the Phantom Stranger than ever before. Plus, Pandora is front and center this issue, and it's been heavily hinted that both she and Phantom Stranger will soon play important roles in the DC Universe. And Doctor 13 is back! Who doesn't love some Doctor 13? Who made horned room glasses chic way before Noah Bennett? And Vertigo debuts a nifty hardcover this week, their adaptation of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I don't know if there's really any demand for this after the Swedish trilogy in David Fincher's American version of the first book, but hey, why not? And as long as we're giving stuff the benefit of the doubt, how about Conan the Barbarian from Dark Horse? Another story arc begins this week, yet another opportunity for you to hop onto one of the best books on shelves right now. Then last, but certainly not least, Saga is back! Fans will rejoice, and if you're not a fan, what are you waiting for? This is Image's hottest title after The Walking Dead, and it's only on issue number 7. You can catch up! And that's this week's Stacktastic. I'm Grace Randall for Think About the Ink, and I'm hoping to get you two Between the Pages episodes this week to make up for last week. Thank you for your continued patience. Until then, happy reading.